Hey guys, Crossflex here with my next deck profile for the Sparkman Yugi Tube Dueling Tourney. We've reached the halfway point until playoffs, and the competition is heating up. I'm going to be continuing to run decks that I enjoy, but the strategies that I'll be employing will be slightly more competitive so that I at least have a fighting chance. That being said, for week 5 against the masterful Misused, I'm bringing the bees. Oh, no, not the bees! Not the bees! Ah! Insects are a theme that I've enjoyed for years, but they've always been missing that uh, je ne sais quoi. Bee troopers, I believe, have given the type an overall theme to latch onto, as well as the speed to back it up. This is a pretty technical combo deck. I'm most likely not going to be piloting this deck as well as I could be, but I've only got so much time to practice before being sent into the dueling arena. But enough talk, let's hop into the profile proper. Despite being branded as a Bee Trooper profile, this deck is actually composed of several different smaller engines, but we'll begin with the Bee Troopers themselves. Triple Scale Bomber is a great extender, as it can special itself for my hand whenever I summon any insect. Not only is this great for spamming an additional body on board, but I can also use it to chain block some of my other monsters that do have on summon effects. This will help keep Ash Blossom on her twinkle toes. Assault Roller is a better version of Aztecapede, since he can be normal summoned if needed to. Obviously, banishing a single insect to special him from hand is a small price to pay. We'll also see that banishing insects can actually be helpful to our deck. Roller has two more effects, but they're hardly ever used. He gets beggar depending on the number of insects I control, but if he does die in battle, he'll search for another Bee Trooper monster. Scout Buggy is a pretty great Bee Trooper, but one that I'm passing up on. Being two monsters in one is quite nice, but he locks us into insects while he's on the field. That's kind of bad, since our inboard bosses aren't bugs. But we are running two more bigger Bee Troopers. One Sting Lancer and one Mighty Neptune. Lancer can drop himself onto the field as a quick effect, making him like a pseudo DD Crow. Also, he searches for a Bee Trooper spell or trap on summon. Like the Lancer, Neptune lets us reuse some of our resources, returning three banished insects to the main deck. Being a beefy 3000 attack body is nice, but having some slight protection is even better. Also, during any end phase, he can permanently buff another insect by a thousand points. If I end up pumping up one of my boss monsters, it could be devastating. Now the cards that can be searched by the Sting Lancer are Double Descent and one Fly and Sting. Descent is a spell that can summon a free Bee Trooper token. Also, if I have a big bug on board, it can pop a back row. Fly and Sting is a reusable counter trap that can negate and destroy a monster. Okay, so honestly, kind of light on the Bee Troopers, but I feel they're the heart and soul of the deck. Our next archetype on display are the Battle Wasps. Like with Scout Buggy, Twin Bow is a great card that I'm going to be passing on since I don't want to hard lock myself out of non-bugs. Instead, the only wasps I am using are... One Arbalest lets us revive a level 3 or lower bug from our grave upon normal summon. The free body is nice, but the stipulation of having it trigger only on normal summons is kind of awkward especially given one of the other engines we're employing in this deck, but we'll get to that later. Keep in mind that this guy can bring out a Battle Wasp from the deck if he's destroyed by an opponent's effect. One, Sting the Poison, is a better Battle Wasp for us, seeing as how this effect can trigger on any summon. He'll search for another Battle Wasp, most likely the next monster on our list, Triple Pin the Bullseye. He's a free extender, as he can bring himself out as long as there's a bug friend already on board. Up next are our generic insects. Triple Resonance Insect really gets our combos going. When sent from field to grave, he can fetch one of our big boys. He also has a when banished effect, neat. This effect is a foolish burial for an insect. Keep in mind that none of this guy's effects are once per turn, so the more you can abuse, the better. Another thing to keep in mind is that he's a great Almirage enabler, since he has only a thousand attack. 
Double Retaliating C is a decent hand trap, depending on the matchup. He's a macro cosmos on six legs. This can definitely interrupt some decks that need their cards to go to the grave. Besides that, he also searches for resonance insects when sent from field to grave. Between the two of them, we've got good resilience for keeping our combos going. I could potentially see myself upping this guy to three copies, but I'm personally sticking with two. Dragon Bite is the newest card in the list. On Normal Summon, he can bring out another level 4 or lower bug from hand. He doesn't plus us an advantage, but he is a tuner, so that's a plus in its own right. Not only that, but by banishing a bug from practically anywhere, we can raise the levels of another monster by the banished monster's level for a turn. This can not only trigger, say, a resonance insect, but it can also help us go into our high-level synchros with ease. Transicada is another insect tuner, and one of the few cards I would consider taking out of the deck. When it's special summoned, I can create a level 3 insect token. Like with Sword Soul, as long as I possess this token, I'm locked into bugs. This can be a problem, but usually I can turn this token into something useful, so it's not that bad of a lock. I may seem like a bit of a hypocrite since I'm running this guy over the scout buggies, but with the scout buggies I gotta get rid of multiple monsters to remove that insect lock, whereas with the Transicada, I only need to clear the one token in order to free myself back up. Goki Pole is currently a one of, but I'm thinking of increasing this number. When it's sent to grave, from anywhere, and by any means, I can add a level 4 or less bug from deck to hand. Not only that, but if I added a normal monster, I can special summon it instead, and then I can pop a monster on the field that's bigger than that card. Thus, I'm also running a singular copy of Goki Boar. Ideally, we never draw this card. It exists as a free body on board for when Goki Pole gets sent to grave. 1200 attack is the weakest normal insect that's still a level 4 that I could find. I want this monster to be level 4 so that it helps with the synchro summoning process. Also, sneak peek of our extra deck, we're running Link Spider. So if we do hard draw this card, we can't actually use the spider to bring it out for free. Doom Dozer is our last generic insect. He's an oldie but a goodie. Like with Assault Roller, we can special him out by banishing bugs from our grave. His effect is actually kinda bad, since he mills our opponent whenever he deals damage, but he's essentially an extender that can also be used to beat over something big. Our next engine is the DPE Package. Like with Dragoon before it, it's a degenerate card that can be splashed into many different decks. This deck in particular spews out tons of extra monsters, so it's nice to have fodder for the Enforcer to pop. Also, having Celestial as a follow-up play can be nice, since we can run through our hand pretty quickly. Our last engine is the reason I've titled this deck Brave Bugs. We're using the new archetype from Grand Creators, the stuff centered around the Adventurer token. Triple Water Enchantress can fetch our Rite of Aramesser spell. This is great for baiting out an Ash Blossom, since we often don't need our brave stuff, it's kinda just the icing on top. Besides fetching our spell, additional copies of Enchantress are not dead, since they can special summon themselves for free, so long as we have that brave token on field. Rite of Aramesser is a spell that brings out an Adventurer token, a 2000 attack and defense monster. Then it can activate a Fateful Adventurer, straight from the deck. This continuous spell is a great advantage engine for us, but there's a couple more things to talk about with the right. The downside is I can't activate the effects of normal summon monsters the turn I play the right. If you recall, there are a couple monsters in our deck that trigger off a normal summon, but there aren't many, so I don't run into this problem that often. Just be sure to keep it in mind. Faithful Adventure has two main effects. Whenever I summon a monster, I can add an equip spell that mentions Adventurer Token from deck to hand. We only have the one brick, but it's pretty nice, so I think it's worth running, especially when going second. The other effect is, once per turn, I can add a monster that mentions Adventurer Token from deck to hand. This is used to grab the main reason we run this engine, Wandering Griffin Rider. As long as we control the proper token, we can, once again, summon him for free. 
Not only does he have a big booty, but he's also an Omni Negate. By putting him back into the deck, he can negate and destroy any card or effect. The last few cards we're running are a few generic good cards and hand traps. Monstry Born, Foolish Burial, and Gold Sark help to set up plays. Double Ghost Ogre is a level 3 tuner that can also stop a lot of common cards in the current meta. Feather Duster deals with the back row for when we want to push for game, and Called By helps to stop various hand traps. Now this extra deck is tight, like a good grape. I don't know why I just said that. Regardless, I really wish I could hold more than 15 cards in here. It's a bunch of one-ofs so that there's as much versatility packed in here as possible. B Trooper Armor Horn simply requires two insects to summon. Once per turn, he can grant us an additional normal summon of an insect. This helps us to link climb into stronger monsters, but the downside is he does lock us into bugs. So basically we can only use him to climb into either Seraph and Papillon or Invincible Atlas. Armor Horn can also revive himself by banishing three bugs from the grave. A bit steep of a cost if you ask me, but if we really need one more monster on board, it could be used. Speaking of Seraphim Papillon, this is an easy to summon Link 3. I try to make this guy whenever I need to clear my board of some strange insect lock, like an Armor Horn or a Transicata token. Each turn, he can revive a level 4 or lower bug. Just not the turn that he's been summoned. Invincible Atlas is our Link 4 boss. He's a 3000 attack point tower style monster. By that, I mean he can't be targeted or destroyed by card effects. Like with Armor Horn though, he locks us into bugs. Given that he's such a beefy, nearly indestructible creature, it does make sense though. Ideally, we'd end on this guy on like our second turn or something like that. Now, he can also tribute a bug to gain 2000 attack or to summon a bee trooper from deck. Either of these effects are decent and can come up, just keep in mind that if you buff his attack, he's going to lose his protection. Insector Picophalana is another insect link monster. When link summoned, we can discard a card to equip an insect from deck to a different insect on board. The point of this is to attach a floater like Resonance Insect, Retaliating Sea, or Goki Pole to another bug. That way, if it's ever popped or whatever, we can get some sort of search out of it. Her second effect is like a mini Pot of Avarice. By shuffling three insects back into the deck, we can draw one card. We usually want our bugs in Grave so that we can banish them as fuel for our other monsters, but if we don't have access to those types of extenders, the extra card could be more useful. Salamon Great Almirage is easy to make in this deck since a lot of our main deck monsters that we would feasibly spend a normal summon on are at 1000 or less attack. The protection effect granted by the Salad is useful, but he's mostly in here to get a bug into the grave on our first turn, not dissimilar to how Invoke decks use it to get Alistair into the grave. Link Spider is the alchemist of our combos. What I mean is that he effectively transmutes a normal monster into an effect monster, so that we can go into Predaplant Anaconda. We run a lot of tokens in this deck, plus the one normal monster brick, so summoning this guy is not hard. Speaking of Anaconda, he's in here too, so that we can make DPE without having to draw the Fusion Destiny. I'm sure I don't have to tell you guys this, since a lot of people have been using this card for a while now, but I'm saying this so that I don't forget. When you use Anaconda's effect, you're locked out of summons for the rest of your turn, so make sure you build your board before dropping the DPE. I generally find Anaconda and this next card as degenerate, but I really wanted to give them a try so I can appreciate things from their point of view. Crystron Halky Fibrax is in here because he's easy to summon. We run a couple different tuners, so we'll almost always have a free body to summon off his first effect. Now, we can also banish this guy using his second effect during our opponent's turn to go into Desert Locusts. This is a weird synchro tuner monster that a lot of decks find difficult to run. Being an insect type, he fits our theme well. Being level 6, we can form our other synchros easily. Not only that, but since Halk can bring this guy out on our opponent's turn, we can actually use the Locust's effect to eat away at our opponent's hand. So what are these other synchros that we can go into? 
Well, we run a bunch of Link monsters, so Borlode Savage is an obvious choice. Built-in negation and a big body is nice to have. Baron de Fleur is another Omni Negate, who can also pop another card each turn. I still can't believe they designed this card to require such generic materials. Crazy. Finally, the last Synchro is a level 12, so it's going to require at least 3 monsters to make, even with the help of Desert Locusts. Ballista the Armageddon can mass banish our grave and then shrink our opponent's field. Also, if he gets destroyed, he will replace himself with three other banished bugs. Cicada King requires any two level 3 monsters, so even Water Enchantress or Ghost Ogre can expedite the summoning process of this guy. He's a little bit of everything. By changing his battle position, he can revive a bug or drop a new one from hand. There's no level restriction here. He has a big booty and can permanently negate a monster by detaching a material. DPE is DPE. I personally don't find him to be as bad of a card as Dragoon was, but he is still a menace. He's an easy to summon interruption that can keep bringing himself back each turn. Finally, our last slot goes to Nightmare Phoenix because it's a generic card that can deal with back row. Also, it's easy to co-link for the free draw since we are running Armor Horn and Link Spider for the down facing arrows. <sighs> Man, I really wish I could include other cards in our extra deck. Access Code Talker is a game ender and we do have a lot of Link attributes. Herald of the Arc Light can be summoned easily and is also an Omni Negate. Other generic synchros would be nice to fit too since we have tons of level variation in our main deck. Overall though, I love this deck. It's just so chock full of extenders that usually I can just keep playing through interruptions. There are tons of combo lines and many decisions to make while operating this deck. Let's take a look at a few test hands and see just what this deck is capable of. Alright, this is a pretty beautiful hand. So we do already have the Griffin Rider in hand, which means that we don't need to search it off of our normal Brave Engine stuff but we don't have any of the Brave spells. Luckily, we do have the Enchantress for that. Now, we could go ahead and chain block the Enchantress search with our Griffin Rider summon. This is nice because that saves our right from getting ashed. I don't think it would protect us from getting Gammoth though. They could Gamma the Griffin, but at least we still get our search. So, assuming that's successful, we can go ahead and fire that off. This will summon a token to our field as well as activating that fateful adventure straight from our deck. Now, since the adventure allows us to search a card whenever we summon, let's go ahead and normal out the Transicada and get a free card. But again, we can chain block this free card by using our Scale Bomber as a free summon. Go ahead and add that equip to hand. Uh, the reason I'm going to add it to hand and not straight equipping it to our token is because now we're going to activate the manual effect of our adventure. We'll go ahead and add another enchantress to hand, but we then have to discard a card. A perfect discard fodder is that equip card because if it's sent to the graveyard by any means, it can just equip itself straight to the token. So essentially this gave us a free discard fodder for that effect. We now control a token, so we can use the enchantress's second effect to go ahead and fill our board with five monsters straight off the bat. Now, what do we have access to? We could turn the Transicada into an Al Mirage, which would get Transicada into the grave, but I'm not really sure what that does for us right offhand. We could go into a Hulk, once again turning that Transicada into something. We could go into Cicada King, because we have tons of level 3 monsters on board. We could even go ahead and Synchro straight into Baron de Fleur right off the bat, but I'm not sure if I really want to end on that just yet. So I think what I want to do is to help thin out the deck just a little bit, let's go ahead and go into that Hulk. I'll turn the Transicada as well as the Enchantress. Yes, let's go ahead and bring out a free monster. Alright, now we've got the two options. We've got the level 2 tuner, or we've got the Ghost Ogre. Unfortunately, the tuner that we bring out from Hulk doesn't get to trigger its effect, so Sting would not give us a free search off of his summon. So I think I'm actually going to go for Ghost Ogre. Another reason to go for Ghost Ogre is, assuming my math is correct, we can still go into Baron de Fleur, which yes we can. So I'm going to turn these... I just clicked the wrong guy. 
Wow. Okay. Well, pretend I did not click that incorrectly. What I meant to do was Ghost Ogre Adventure Token Scale Bomber. That should also be 10 levels worth of monsters. So at this point, I would be pretty much done with my turn. Surprisingly, very little B plays, but we would be ending our turn with a Baron and a Griffin Rider, which basically means two negations. And the Halk can, as a quick effect, turn into Desert Locust, which would give our opponent a discard. And of course, we also have the Ghost Ogre in hand as one further interruption. So that would be four interruptions with, unfortunately, not much of a follow-up play. Let's just go ahead and pass turn here and see what our next card is. Alright, it would be a Doom Dozer. I don't believe we have enough insects in Grave. We don't, so Doom Dozer is actually kind of dead here. Although, if I had attributed the correct number of monsters, we would also have the Scale Bomber in Grave. So we would actually have the right number of monsters to bring out a Doom Dozer. So we would have a follow-up play of some kind. We can also continue to use our Fateful Adventure here to go ahead and search for another Water Enchantress, which we could pitch for another right, which would get us another Adventure Token on the field. So that'd be a 2000 attack, a 28 attack, we'd still have Baron, we could swap Locust into attack mode, so we really have a lot of plays we can go from here. So let's go ahead and restart this and see what another test hand looks like. Alright, so we have opened up one of our bricks, the equip brave spell thingy. And we've got a Ghost Ogre for Interruption, which is nice, I suppose, but we also have a Doom Dozer and the Mighty Neptune, both in our opening hand. Wow, this is one of the worst opening hands, actually, that I can think of. There's literally nothing we can do. We can set Resonance Insect, or I guess I could have Normal Summoned it and linked it into Al Mirage, but it's not like it would have really done anything. The Resonance Insect would have then searched for a card, again, the Sting Lancer, but we'd have all of our big insects in hand and nothing to summon it with. So this is pretty much an instant loss unless our opponent also bricks. So uh, yeah, I mean, this can feasibly happen, so it's something you gotta work with. Um, like I said, I need to tweak this deck list just a little bit more. Through testing, I don't get this bad of a bricky hand that often, but yeah, I'm trying to cut down on this, so definitely leave some comments down below on how you would change this. But since this is a pretty dead hand, let's do one more test hand and see how things turn out. Alright, this one is a little bit better. <laughs> of course, we've got at least one brick in our hand. Still not that bad, because having the Fusion Destiny in hand means that we don't necessarily have to build our board into Anaconda in order to get the DPE off. We have the freedom to just activate the Fusion Destiny outright. First thing to consider is, again, trying to bait out any Ashes. This deck can function pretty well without the Brave Engine, so I always like using it as fodder for baiting out any Ashes and Gammas and stuff like that. Assuming they do let it through though, they're going to give us tons of advantage, especially in this case. So I'm going to go ahead and activate that Rite of Aramesser that I searched for, summon out a token, bring out the Fateful Adventure, yes, very nice. Now I'm going to normal summon this Transicada, activate the effect of Adventure to search for that equip spell. Go ahead and add it to hand just like normal. That way now, when I activate the Adventure effect to search for the Griffin Rider, I can pitch the equip and then go ahead and attach it for free. That way it's like free real estate. I should have uh, chained the Griffin Rider summon there, that way it would, you know, chain block if anyone tried to say like go spell the equip. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone would ever waste a go spell on the equip because it's not like it does anything, especially on turn one. But, you know, just in case, say this was turn two, for example, you know, doing the griffin there would have been nice to chain block. Alright, I've got an insect on board, so I can summon pin for free. Now, something else, it doesn't usually come up, because when does 200 life points matter? Very, very rarely. But just in case, you never know. Go ahead and activate pin's effect to just burn our opponent for 200. Next, we can go into some stuff. We've got Halk for some plays here. Yeah, let's actually, let's do that. Go ahead and thin our deck out just a little bit. Yep, go ahead and activate that. No, I'm not going to Griffin my own Halk. We have two different options to go here. 
We can go into a level 2 Sting, so that we can form a level 6 Synchro, that's not really enough for anything. We also have Bee Trooper Descent still on our hand, which can give us a free level 3 monster. So, kind of like the first replay actually, if we go for one of our Ghost Ogres, then we activate the Bee Trooper Descent. This gets us 10 levels of stuff on field. So let's go ahead and go into Baron. One, two, three, ah, ah, ah. Summon Baron. Then let's go ahead and finish it off with a Fusion Destiny. Get rid of these bricks, summon this, and we are looking pretty snazzy if I do say so myself. DPE for popping our opponent. Halk goes into Desert Locust for a discard. And of course, we would preferably Halk first into the Desert Locust. Once we get that discard, then the Locust itself doesn't really do too much for us. So we can DPE the Locust to pop a card on our opponent's field. And of course, if we do want to keep the Desert Locust around, say we want to save it for Synchro Summoning next turn, we can always pop the DPE himself. He's going to keep coming back every turn. we got Griffin and Baron for two Omni Negates. And of course, on our following turn, if they don't manage to out that Baron, we're going to pop something else on their field. Oh man, it's looking good. Our hand is empty as well, so for our follow-up turn, what we can do is most likely trigger that Celestial to get a free draw to. Alright, so let's just go ahead and play out one more turn of this and see exactly how it works. Well, of course I've uh, misclicked, but that's alright. It's not like the Fateful Journey was really going to do too much else for us right now. That's uh, definitely something I gotta learn, is uh, again, just I'm not very good with Edo Pro. <laughs> I'm really not. I misclick all the time, no matter how slow I think I am, it just never works. Now unfortunately, with the specific card we've drawn, we actually can't use the Celestial effect like I was planning on doing, because Mighty Neptune requires us to bring three of our banished insects back into the deck. And, although we've got a Banish Pile, none of them are Insects currently, and I don't have a way of banishing them either. Desert Locust being a level 6 is actually too high of a level for us to summon anything from our deck, so honestly that's not much of a follow-up play. But given the fact that our opponent most likely was not able to do too much on their turn, and the fact that we've got two more pops incoming, and a bunch of attack points on board, I think we would most likely seal up the game. So hopefully this gives you a decent enough demonstration of what the deck is capable of. Uh, honestly, these test hands didn't really show off too much of the bug engine itself. It was mostly the brave engine pulling most of the duty here. But trust me, the bugs themselves definitely carry themselves really well. One last thing I want to mention is that Bee Trooper Scale Bomber and Battle Wasp Sting the Poison are actually forms of interruption on their own. They're kind of little known effects that they have, but they both mess with monster effects in their own way. So if there's an extra scale bomber or sting the poison left over on my field at the end of my combo, it's not the end of the world as, again, if I can't use them to make a better monster, they can at least put in a little work on their own. This is a deck that I've been testing for about two to three weeks now. I think it does still need a little more tweaking, so maybe you guys could let me know down in the comments below what changes you would make and why. I'm still new to the competitive scene in Yu-Gi-Oh, and I'd love to learn more. Alright Misused, I hope you've packed your bug spray because I'm coming for you. Everyone, have a blessed day and I'll see you in the next one.